Hi, yeah. everyone. It's so lovely to see you. Uh, let's see if I can get back here to my screen. What's up, Hi, everybody? Everyone. How are, How are you today? Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Pocket Conversations, an occasional series where we invite writers and journalists to come talk about their writing with us and their work. Today, we are delighted to have Mateo Escarapur with us, whose debut novel, Black Book, has recently become a New York Times bestseller. Congrats about that. Um, Mateo was a 2018 Rhode Island Writers Colony writer in residence. His writing has appeared in Entrepreneur, Lit Hub, Catapult, and more, and he actually also curated a fantastic pocket collection for us about um, some of his inspirations behind Black Book, uh, which we'll discuss today. So um, welcome, Mateo. Thank you so much for joining us. I think, is Mateo on mute? Yes, we thanks go. so much for having me. I coughed. So I muted myself <laughs> and then I realized that muting myself is like being put in Zoom jail. So uh, <laughs> if I great. cough anyone or Let's anything, I'm just going to do it live. <laughs> I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me, Carolyn. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Um, before we get started, I do want to say we um, will try to take some questions from attendees uh, toward the end. Um, mm -hmm. For all those in attendance, if you do want to ask a question, you can put it into Zoom chat. Just direct it to ask me a question, one of the co-hosts, not to everyone, and we'll get to it toward the end. Um, so Mateo, uh, 2021 has been off to an amazing start for you. You were part of the uh, Today Show Book Club, yeah. uh, New York Times bestseller list, uh, just fantastic reviews. What's the, what's the ride been like? It's been, uh, it's been wild. There, there's just been a lot going on, a lot that I'm grateful for. Um, but what I think has been the most valuable experience is having people reach out to me and say that the book touched them deeply. And for many people, they felt seen for the first time in a long time. So uh, the New York Times bestsellers, cool. Today's show, cool. Actually, check me out tomorrow, 10 a.m. I'll be on it with uh, Jenna Bush Hager and, and the wonderful Hoda. But um, having readers write to me directly just saying how the book touched them has meant everything because I wrote it for them, you know? That's great. That's so great to hear. Um, so what I loved about Black Book was um, this kind of mix of themes that it had, right? Like it's this darkly comic satire about the startup world, um, mm. which is its own kind of genre, I think. Um, but it also is this biting commentary about the tenacity of racism in corporate America. Um, but it's also kind of, it's got these threads of like a classic business book, you know, with, the, with business advice and almost like life tips mm -hmm. throughout. So um, how did you strike upon this mix of themes? Yeah, tone is something that um, a lot of people are curious about because the book, <laughs> it changes from page to page and chapter to chapter and part to part. And the most honest answer that I've arrived at, because these interviews are still helping me honestly figure out um, certain things about the book, um, even though many of my intentions were clear, but the most honest answer is that that's just a reflection of my mind. That's how my mind works. Whereas, you know, I could be very sincere and serious um, one second or one minute, and then a few minutes later poking fun at the absurdity of that, that same somewhat tragic theme. So we see this in the book. Um, Racism, systemic racism, institutional racism, all, all faces of racism are horrible and tragic. But um, for many people, if you've experienced it enough, it's absurd and, and almost funny at times. And we see that in the book, right? For example, um, without giving any spoilers, at first Dan is, is asked, has anyone ever told you you look like MLK? And then a couple chapters later, has anyone ever told you you look like Sidney Poitier? Then it's Malcolm X then it's Dave Chappelle, then it's Drake. And at first it's funny. And by the end, it might still be funny, but you're like, does this actually happen to people, right? So it's making you think. And that was the tone that I wanted to strike where there is humor used to underscore the horror of what many of us experience inside and out and outside of the workplace. But at the same time, I didn't want it to just be an engaging narrative. I wanted it to be something that would help people, help people better understand these issues, help people better work through them um, and help many people understand that they deserve just as much as anyone else to chase success and happiness um, and in some cases achieve it. 
Hence the whole sales mem- sales manual, self-help aspect to it. I wanted to hit home that there are real gems for people to read and internalize and pass on to others. You, um, you worked in the, in the startup world. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, like, can you tell us a little bit about your experience there? And if, if there is, you know, how that echoes in what we hear from, from Darren slash book um, yeah. on his journey, like how well, much is true to the life? Uh, yeah, there you go. Now you just asked it. Um, it's, I was, I was like, okay, I'm about to skirt around this, but you just asked really straight. Um, you know, how much is true? It's hard to quantify. If you've, if you watched this series of my interviews, I changed the number, right? I'm like, okay, 20%, 25%, 30% could be true, but, um, it's hard to know because there's so much interwoven with the story. But what is true are the feelings that the characters feel. I've experienced all of those feelings, um, triumph, success, betrayal, sadness, you know, minor depression, elation. I've experienced all of those things. And I had to um, mine my own emotional sphere and history to imbue the characters and the plot with those feelings. But I also wouldn't have been able to write this book without having worked in sales and startups because for anyone that, that has worked in those environments, you read this book and you're like, whoa, he could be writing about my environment because this rings so true to my own experience in terms of the acronyms or in terms of what it's like to pick up a phone to call up someone halfway across the country and be hung up on 200 times a day. Um, that, that sense of we are changing the world through selling a more ergonomic chair or a better bedspread, or you see what I'm saying? This, this whole yep. like egocentrism to the world of startups and this manifest destiny, I experience all of those things. And in, in many instances throughout my, my career, I was selling that. And I'm not talking about the other people on the phone. I'm talking about to young folks to come and join this company where we are changing the world through selling X, Y, Z. Um, so I experienced much of that, but when we talk about the overt racism that Darren experiences, I didn't experience that in the workplace. I experienced it outside of the workplace when I was younger. And I said, let me translate that experience to what Darren goes through to show to so many people how even sometimes mundane or innocuous slights, also known as microaggressions, could feel hyperbolic and exaggerated. That's what I wanted people to experience while reading uh, a few of those scenes. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your transition to writing. Um, this is your debut novel, yeah. um, but I can't imagine, you know, from what I know about you, this isn't the first book you've written. No. So what, what, where did you get started? I mean, what was the transition like? It wasn't easy. Um, and there were many necessary lessons in it. I began writing seriously when I was still working at the startup that I was at. Um, I began writing a manuscript for a fiction novel, May 21st, 2016. And I was writing this high from being this big sales guy, this startup dude who people respected in New York City, people admired. I had many underlings that were coming to me nonstop, you know, throughout the day. Mateo, help me with this, that and the other, right? Um, so I was like, you know what? I'm just going to transition to being this writer. I was a sales guy. I'm going to be this writer. I could sell my way into the industry, you know, even if my writing's not super tight. Uh, and that's not how it happened at all, right? <laughs> I, I left my job August 18th, 2016. Um, I had finished uh, that first manuscript a little bit after that. And then I started just hitting up the biggest and best literary agents. And they're like, you're not supposed to call them. I was like, why not? I've made thousands of phone calls. I mean, call them up. And they're like, why mm-hmm. are you calling me? Hang up, right? So the first manuscript didn't go anywhere. And I was like, ugh. And I had agents looking at it too, eventually. I had like nine agents that were reading it, but the writing wasn't there. I was like, all right, you know, time to go back to the drawing board. So a couple months later, I basically rewrote that first manuscript and pitched it out again. I had a handful of agents looking at it, but nothing happened. And I had learned more about being a writer and what it meant to write and plot and structure by that time. But my aim was off. With that second manuscript, it was like, okay, now I'm going to get an agent. I know how to get an agent. Didn't work. So there came this necessary humbling, this fall where I was like, who did I think I was? that I could go from some sales guy and that my skills would translate into writing. And it was at that point um, that I had the idea, I had the seed for what would become Black Buck. 
And I said, you know what? Stop pandering to agents, stop pandering to the industry. Do I want an agent? Yes. Do I want a book deal? Yes. But what I want more than anything now is to write a book that feels true to me, the people I want to serve and the state of the country that we live in. And it worked out because there's also, you know, a world, Carolyn, where I'm not sitting here, where I'm working on manuscript eight. <laughs> and, and you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I'm grateful. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your writing process because we, yeah. one of the recommended reads that we actually sent out to folks um, as um, we were promoting this, this conversation with you was um, a piece you wrote about your, your writing process. Um, mm -hmm. And you just, you've described it as kind of cathartic and therapeutic. Um, and you were also right about this, this benefit of writing fast yeah. and fixing later, which I think is really interesting. And you wrote, finishing quickly as possible while not judging myself too much during the process is what I've found to help me progress in my literary career the most. Mm -hmm. So what, how, why that? And I have to say, it, it reminded me a little bit of like move fast and break things, um, exactly. but in your own, own small way, <laughs> that echoes a little it. bit. But I, you know, why, why that process? Yeah. Um, first of all, welcome everyone here. We got a lot of people in here. Thank you. Um, and for those who don't know what Carolyn just mentioned, move fast and break things. It's like a startup maxim, just like fail fast. Um, and that's the world that I came from. So that's the energy I was taking into me trying to break in and get on as a writer. You know, I mentioned that I wrote two manuscripts. I wrote those two manuscripts in a year and they weren't short. Um, they were like combined maybe 170,000 words or, or, or more. Um, but I knew that if I was going to succeed, I had to take risks and I couldn't think too much about the past, right? I had to have a, a short-term memory when it came to my losses while examining why didn't this first manuscript work out? Why do I think this second manuscript didn't, didn't work out? What can I do to improve? It was important for me to analyze, but not dwell. So I just kept moving and, and giving myself that freedom to forge ahead and not get so stuck in rejection and quote unquote failure is what allowed me to write Black Buck and to, to eventually come to that place where I said, I'm going to write the book the way that I want and the book that I want for the people I want to serve and, and so forth. Um, for me, speed is important because we're changing all the time. And if you are... And, Please, anyone who's here listening, this is not a one size fits all. I, I really detest when people give out this generalized advice that they that they say take this as as you know a biblical verse that you got or a commandment, you know. Um, so what works for me might might work for you or might not. But for me, speed is important because we're changing so fast. So if it would have taken me five years to write Black Buck, opposed to from the day that I wrote it to when we sold it, it was a year and eight months. The first draft took about five months though. Okay, so that's fast. And that was 168,000 words. But there's reasons why I wrote so many words because I was undisciplined. But if it would have taken me five years, I might have not finished the book or the book would have been <laughs> even more disjointed or it's just going off in all these different, these different places. It wouldn't have come together. So it was important for me to get it down quickly, to finish it, to not judge myself while I was writing it, to have fun. And then when I was done with that first draft, say, now it's time for more work, a different type of work, not the draft, but the revision, multiple revisions. Well, so yeah, can you, can you give a little window into how, how close the book, the ultimate book, the end version was to that initial fast, get mm -hmm. it onto the page version? Like yeah, it's, it's close. It's definitely very close. Cause that, with that first draft, um, I was putting my heart and my soul into it and mm -hmm. my heart and my soul from 2018 when I began to now hasn't changed. Other things have my mind in certain ways, right? Um, that's changed, but my heart and my soul has still, for the most part, remained the same. Um, so when I was revising it, it was about cutting. I cut a lot of characters out. There's people that you never mm. got to meet. Yeah, there was another founding member, member of the Happy Campers. Um, wow. She was like the PR woman. Um, Barry D, who's in there, for people who haven't read the book, you'll meet Barry D. Barry D um, was a little bit more nefarious and he changed a lot. and and. Darren, you know, now Buck. Um, there was a lot of things that went on. That's the point. There were a lot of subplots oh, with other mm -hmm. characters that had to get cut out. Um, so there was that. But I also added a few things. Going back to your first question, it was with the fourth draft that I decided to break the fourth wall in such a mm. conspicuous way and say, reader, 
in bold, breaking away from the preceding and succeeding paragraphs right here, addressing the reader. Because I always wanted it to be this sales manual, but I, but I, I learned a few things along the way. And then I said, why not punch it up and, and press forward and just really let people know what I'm doing here. So that was something I added to the fourth draft right before I actually queried the um, great woman who's now my agent. I, it was one of my favorite kind of uh, uh, attributes of the book mm. because it, you know you have these this kind of for folks who haven't read it this bolded language these kind of like life sales uh, maxim life mm -hmm. tips um, sprinkled throughout where where Darren slash book just breaks the fourth wall really talks to the reader directly and I actually wrote down a couple of, of my favorites and I wanted to ask you um, of all of that advice kind of imparted in bold what what rang true like I wrote down one was pain is a powerful teacher which I loved mm -hmm. and I also loved there was one that was the quality of the answer is determined by the quality of the question which I really really liked um you know that's that's uh, what all journalists I think live and die by mm -hmm. um but you know do you if you had to um uh engrave one on <laughs> on a desk what would you what would you put down What's, what's been the most ring, ringing most true to your ex own experience? Yeah, it's tough. There's a lot in there. Um, and I'm not going to get this right. It was Wally Cat who said it, you know, um, but he's saying that, you know, you need to have a short term memory. And if people aren't talking about you even poorly in terms of what you're doing, then you're not really doing anything. And if people are, are praising you, that's great. But you need to forget that that too. He says, you got to forget that shit too. Sorry, mom. My mom's here. What's up, Taryn? <laughs> I see my publicist here too. But he's like, you got you to forget that even quicker. So it's having this balanced mind, right? This equanimity where you can receive the praise, you can mm -hmm. receive the criticism, but you will not go too far in one direction because that's just going to knock, knock you off and, and cause Hold you to lose focus. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the pocket collection that you curated for us as well, sure. um, which was kind of this mixtape of inspirations. And I thought really veered really ingeniously from the Black Panther, Black Panthers to Kurt Vonnegut to uh, Basquiat. McKinsey and company made uh, an appearance on there, which I thought was just like um, such a nice uh, surprise. So what was the thread there? What was the kind of connective tissue when you were putting that together? Yeah. Um... The connective tissue, at least when it came to the people that I featured, were artists who lived unabashedly. Um, and not just artists, right? Including the Black Panthers, people who recognized the realities that we lived in, but didn't allow them to pull them under, right? Because there's, we, there's so much that can just pull us under, pull us into negativity, but people who rose above it and lived their lives unashamedly of who they were and were very articulate about who they were through their art and through the way that they spoke. So those are just people who inspire me. Um, if we got down to the nitty gritty, I could tell you one or two things about every one of those um, articles that I cited. The McKinsey and Company just hits home um, factually the need for more diversity and real inclusion and equity. It's not just what we need in the workplace is diversity, right? Let's go hire some tokens. We see what happens in someone, S-U-M-W-N, the organization or startup that Darren, my protagonist, uh, works at. Um, it's not just let's get some tokens, but let, let us actually change the culture of the place so that they feel included and can thrive and we can get more people in. Um, so that's where McKinsey plays in. Kurt Vonnegut, what I love so much about that article is he is it's, it's true. It's a true story of him being surrounded by a bunch of writers in a bar in, in Manhattan, I believe. And they ask him, when does he write? And he says, I'm always writing. I'm writing right now. And it sounds like one of those things that a writer would say to make themselves seem cool. But that's sort of how I work, too. I'm always writing. Right. Not exactly now, because I'm trying to be present in the moment. But if I'm just sitting down or if I'm on my bed or walking down the street, I'm constantly thinking of things and will then write them down in my notes. Um, and that's not to say that everything is good. Most of it is like, yeah, cool. It sounds good in the moment, but it's not I'm not going to do anything with it. But I'm constantly right. I'm working on another another book that's in the back of my mind right now. Mm -hmm. That's great. I do want to ask you um, something that's come in. Um, by one of our attendees here. Um, and they ask, throughout the book, 
book references certain songs by artists such as Kid Cudi. Um, what significance do the songs hold? Like, did you think a lot about that kind of mixtape that you reference throughout the book? I did. And thank you so much for the question. The, the songs, I mean, for me, music is medicinal. Um, and I have, I have this whole, like, I was going to say first aid kit, but sort of like that, where I, I know what songs will get me into a certain mode or mood. Um, it's also like a tool belt, another, you know, I don't mean to mix the metaphor, but um, or throw too many out there. But for me, music is healing, but also something that I can dive into. If I have the right song at the right time, that will get me in the necessary mode to do something, right? I listened to music right before this to get me, you know, jazzed up and ready. Um, so in the book, Buck is, and is Darren in the beginning when he's, when he's listening to a lot of those songs, um, we see him searching out or seeking out music that will help him in his journey, right? So we have Meek Mills, Polo and Shell Tops. For anyone who's ever listened to it and you really listen to it, you're gonna see that Meek Mill is talking about trying to make it and succeed and overcome any obstacle that comes in his way. Now he's talking about dealing drugs, right? Buck isn't exactly doing that. He's dealing something else, um, a vision or hope um, or a product. But we see that with Meek, Meek Mill, right? Or Pursuit of Happiness by Kid Cudi that's also in there. Um, he is on the pursuit of happiness and Buck is on the pursuit of success, but we later find out that he was seeking something else all along that he didn't even know. And I'm not gonna say what that is because you'll have to read the book and find out. So the music uh, played a key role and something that did change, Carolyn, to go to one of your questions was, I'd actually written out a lot of the lyrics and then I was told that it was going to become, it was going to be very difficult and expensive for me to have these artists actually sign off on the lyrics. Mm -hmm. So I just, I said, mm, I don't need to do that. I just cut it out and, and <laughs> kept, the, kept the vibe and people can listen to the, the songs if they want. Thank you well, for the question. The um, we have another one from uh, the audience that I'd love to ask. And um, this is, uh, what would your advice for an aspiring black writer be? Don't focus on the industry. Do not care about the industry. Um, you, if you are this black writer who's attending here, cool. Um, for me, I loved going to readings to just hear from the person discuss their work as well. And that was important for me. But to pay attention to the who's who on social media, that was detrimental to me because I felt as though I began to pander to them. I wanted to be buddy buddy and cool with everyone. I'd reach out to a bunch of people thinking that somehow being friends with them was going to help me when in fact, not really. All of, that, all of that pandering or trying to be cool with people just detracted away from what matters most and what I discovered, which is the work. It's not exactly your personality. It's not your background, whatever it might be, at least speaking for myself, right? I couldn't rely on who I was as the salesman to help me write uh, a, a book that would speak credibly, you know, in a literary sense to a reader or an editor. You know, I had to actually do the work and write. So what I would say to you is don't pay too much to the industry. Um, read things that you honestly vibe with and that resonate with you, but aren't being super hyped up. And I say this as someone with a book that's being hyped up right now, you know, um, read deeply those individuals, especially black writers that changed me as a writer, reading more black writers um, and hone your voice and don't let anyone mess with that. So we could go on and on, but uh, those it. are just a few pieces of advice. And I hope that they're helpful and don't stop. Good luck. That's so great. Um, this kind of segues into another audience question we've gotten. Thank you so much. Love for the these audience. Fantastic questions. What was something you held back as a writer that you've overcome with this book? Ooh. I know. I wish I knew the names of these people so I could just say thank you, whatever. But <sighs> wow. Now we're gonna get real. Uh, something that I had to overcome was uh, like a concern of people that I knew or that I know, right? And, and who I knew before I was this writer or this author being like, you're right, why are you writing this? Or, you know, what, what's your agenda? Or just like this doubt and this gaslighting or, oh, or do you think that you're actually being more divisive by writing something like Black Buck or whatever, you know, things that no one has really articulated to me that I know. Um, the, the reception from people that I knew from past lives and communities that have raised me has been overwhelmingly positive, actually. 
including um, the place that I used to work at. So many of those people have gone to bat for this book and are promoting the hell out of it. But I had to get over that in my mind. Um, even before I was writing Black Buck, when I was writing a bunch of essays, um, and some of those essays are on medium, they're, they're deeply personal and vulnerable. And I had to get all of those people out of my head and all of that non-existent doubt or criticism that hadn't even manifested really, I had to get the thought of it out of my mind to write these hyper vulnerable stories. So that's something that I had to overcome as well as um, not so much in Black Buck, but uh, on the path that led me to write this, you know, those essays that I referenced, I had to get over thinking that I was like writing trauma porn. Right, so for, for many black and brown writers, if you're writing about traumatic experiences, people could view that as you're just putting out your trauma for this outpouring for like the white gaze and to have people, you know, just buy your work, consume it or feel for it and share it. Share it. Um, and some of my pieces, if you go on Medium and you read those, you'll see that I'm talking about real things and real things that I experienced. And part of me was like, okay, do I actually want to put this out? Will this just be serving some other agenda? But when I shared those pieces with people who have also gone through those things, they said, I feel less alone because you wrote this. So I was like, whatever, to external thoughts or forces, I need to put this out for those people who it'll resonate with. Yeah, Thanks for that question. Good. We got deep. So good. Um, I want to talk, um, you uh, added a bio to, a line to your bio, I should say, um, about how you strive to empower people of color to seize opportunities for advancement just mm -hmm. like your protagonist in mm -hmm. Black Buck. Um, what does that look like for you? What are you, what are you hoping to accomplish? Shout out to my editor, my editor's here. Um, what am I hoping to accomplish? I'm hoping to accomplish um, a few things, but the first is what it says on the face, right? To empower other people, to people of color and, and black and brown folks to chase success and in as many instances as possible, achieve it. Because for so many of us, there's a thought that, hey, I don't really see people like me doing X, Y, Z, right? Um, we saw via the New York Times, publishing is only like 5% black in terms of the books that come out. So you know how many people are seeing I guess Black Buck and are like, oh, this dude, who he also doesn't really have his MFA. He came from this different background. He could write a book and like, it could be a New York Times bestseller. So that for me is important. But to answer the question directly, I try not to limit myself in terms of what that looks like, right? It could mean when I mentor my cousin every week and she has a business based around um, racial equity in the classroom and I'm helping her uh, basically connect with more people and make money from her workshops and not just do it for free because so many people want us to just do stuff for free. It could look like... Um, editing a friend's manuscript who doesn't have an agent and wants to get a book deal and whose work I actually believe in. And, and she's writing very uniquely. So me editing her manuscript, it could be just disseminating information in a one-on-one -on -one instance um, with, with people who reach out and say, Hey, I'm inspiring, you know, a uh, black or brown writer. Do you have any advice for me? And me taking a moment to say X sort of what, what we did earlier, right? Sort of saying that, right. But in the same way, I can't do that all the time. I can't have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. So I'm trying to actually figure out um, ways to do it on a bigger scale, whether that means recording videos that people can just go back to um, and giving that out for free or hosting Instagram lives or for folks who know about that new app Clubhouse, I've been hosting some sessions there. So I guess the um, underlying thing here is sharing information and letting people know that success isn't guaranteed, but you have the right to chase it just as much as everyone else. That's great. Um, we're almost at time here. So um, last question I want to ask, and you previewed a little bit, I think, but what's next for you? Yeah, so uh, I'm working on another book and uh, it's, you know, I'm focusing on a lot of promo for Black Buck, of course. So I'm going to have to focus on that a little bit later, but it's, it's gyrating, it's percolating in the back of my mind. And, and I have many thoughts about it. Um, we're working on some Hollywood stuff, you know, new soon oh, come. Um, but aside from that, 
what I'm getting the most joy out of and where I'm focusing most of my time is, is with readers and people who reach out or, you know, I'll see an Instagram review and I want to check it out to see if I can learn something new about uh, the book from their perspective. So that's, that's what excites me most right now. That's great. Mateo, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, thank you to all the attendees. Um, Black Buck, uh, it's available now. It's so great. Uh, highly recommended. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, to all the attendees, we'll, we'll send out a survey afterwards. We'd really appreciate if you can give us some feedback on, on this series so we can improve these going forward. But um, Mateo, we'll, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much and congrats on your, all your success. Carolyn, thank you and thank Pocket. Peace. Have a good one. Thanks.